things if you are online. Uh, welcome everyone in person and online. This is part one out of three of our IFR seminar series that I'm hosting in the next few weeks. So today is the first one. Then on December 9th, we're going to have one on IFR flying to Monterey. And then December 16 is IFR flying to Watsonville. If you come on to December 9th session, we have a holiday hangar party afterwards. So you can just hang around and have fun with us. We have food, drinks, uh, family, pilot community gathering. And it's a fabulous time for everyone. And then if you are really dedicated and love IFR like I do, I am hosting IFR Ground School next year, starting in January 7. So if IFR is something that you're interested in, I invite you to come and join. Anyone who have joined my classes before can attend the future classes for free. This is quite exciting. But today we're talking about IFR flying into Half Moon Bay. I love audience interactions. So if you're online, please put in your emojis, your chat box, and Taylor's monitoring the chat box. Along the way, I'll pause, ask to see if anyone have questions. So any questions you put in a chat box, he'll let me know, and I'll make sure I answer them. Uh, for housekeeping purposes, um, this will be recorded. And if you would like FA Wings credit, which you can use to help with your flight review, it's completely free, these events, then all you need to do is at the end of the session, go on a website, it's called bit.ly dot, so B-I-T dot L-Y slash I-F-R Hat Moon Bay. That's just a shortcut URL that allows you to go to this Google form that I created, where it will ask for your name and your email address because that's how I validate your credit in the FIA system. Um, it's also a place where if you have comments, feedback, you love something, you hate something, please leave it out. I thought this was brilliant what you shared. Uh, that's also the place as well if you want a recording of this session today, if you have questions, if you want information on future events, that's also where you let me know. So I'll share this link again. But just write it down bit.ly bit.ly slash IFR Half Moon. Um, a little bit about me. So I worked previously in science and engineering. That's why I love IFR. I'm obsessed with the technical aspect of IFR. I think it's incredible. There's very few modes of transportation in the world where you can fly completely blind and still be safe. <laughs> Imagine if I tell you, I'm gonna go out and drive a car. I can't see anything. I'm gonna be fine. Nothing's gonna happen. I'll get from A to B hundreds of miles and still be fine. You tell me you're crazy, but you can do it up in an airplane. And in some very fancy ships, you can do that as well. So the scientific aspect of IFR fascinates me. I also work in law. I love the regulations aspect because the great thing about knowing the rules is you know <laughs> when you're about to break it, back it up a little bit, and <laughs> how to make sure you never break any rules. I also work in education marketing. I love to share information, knowledge with other people. I'm a CFI, double I and MEI. So I teach single engine, multi-engine. I teach private instrument, multi-engine ground schools at uh, different schools. I'm also an FAA safety representative, which means every month I gather around with other FAA safety representative. And we talk about the accident cases that are happening around the country, around our city, around our local area. So the ideas that I share with you is taking into account many of these accident cases analysis that's happening, making sure that we share information to keep you safe. I've flown small trainer aircrafts and I've flown business jets across North America from Florida, Texas, New York, all the way to California. And I've flown to Mexico, Canada, so I can share you my experiences around that. What I love to do is accelerated advanced training. So anyone who wants to learn fast and who's really disciplined and focused 
I'm the person. If you like things to take over a longer amount of time, I kind of struggle with that because I'm just a very fast paced, accelerated kind of person. But if that's your thing, I love training, advanced training. Uh, I train instrument, commercial, CFI, CFII, multi-engine, and MEI. That's my specialty. So today's flight plan. Um, we're going to talk about why visit Hat Moon Bay. You got to have a cool reason to go somewhere. Otherwise, why are we going there? Uh, why you should fly to Hat Moon Bay versus bike or drive? Why you want to learn how to fly IFAR to Hat Moon Bay? Why should you learn IFAR at all if you never plan to fly into the clouds? I've had instrument students who tell me, well, I'm just learning this because it's a stepping stone. One day I want to be a commercial pilot or maybe a CFI, but I don't intend to fly into the clouds anytime soon. Well, I'm going to share with you why it's important to learn IFR, even if you never plan to fly into the clouds. I'm going to teach you my three key questions. Um, I call it house three key questions because it's not an FA handbooks. I just made it up. But I think that from all my experience, this is what I distill to be the most important thing, that if you can answer these three key questions, you can master flying easily in any aircraft. So I'll share with you that. Um, I'm going to share with you a flight that I've done with Taylor. He's a CFI. He's helping me here. From Reed Hill View to Half Moon Bay and back, how we plan and think through the approach, how we fly, and how we plan and think through the departure, and how we flew the departure, and we'll talk about risk management. So for now, I'm going to pause. Any questions so far online or in person before we move on? All right, great. So first question is, why visit Hat Moon Bay? And in your chat box, if you have great reasons why you love to visit Hat Moon Bay, please put it down so I know what else to do when I go to Hat Moon Bay. But this is why I go to Hat Moon Bay. I go for the food. There's fabulous restaurants, oceanfront. It's amazing. Clam chowder, spicy food, a burgers, brewing company. Yeah, Sean has friends living there. The view is spectacular. The temperature is really nice and cool there. And I go there for the adventure. For example, there's a place where you can do goat yoga. I don't know if anyone likes pets, <laughs> but you do yoga and these goats are walking around, baby goats playing around with you. It's super relaxing. There's pumpkin patches, Christmas farms, amazing food. And I love to kayak in the ocean. So Half Moon Bay has this great company that allows you to go with them and kayak in the ocean. Awesome place to go. By fly to Hat Moon Bay, well, this is a question that I asked my instructor when I first started to train on how to fly. How do I know if I'm supposed to be a pilot? And he said, you know that you're meant to be a pilot if you like looking at things from the sky. <laughs> so if you love looking at the view from the sky, Half Moon Bay is one of the best view, the destination is incredible. And you know you're meant to be a pilot if you hate sitting in traffic. <laughs> if you love skipping over everything, flying in the sky, and watching everyone crawling along the road and go, ha, <laughs> we beat the traffic today. This is why I love to fly Half Moon Bay. Yeah, some of you agree, thank you. <laughs> I hate traffic too. Now, why fly IFR to Hat Moon Bay? Why not just do it visual? Well, because some days it looks fabulous. It's gorgeous. This is a VFR flight plan we flew in. If you do the Bay Tour, you have a gorgeous view of Hat Moon Bay coming back if you do the coastal route. But most days, it can be in and out with these clouds that comes in and out, sometimes unexpected, sometimes expected. So we need to learn how to navigate it. So this is where the exit analysis case comes in. Um, the AOPA have a whole program around developing safety education. One of the biggest risk factors for pilots is this idea of VFR into IMC. So AO PA writes on their website, every year pilots continue flying inadvertently from visual flight conditions into instrument flight conditions, VFR into IMC, and the results are often fatal. VFR into IMC is the worst weather-related 
cause of accidents each year with a fatality rate of 86%, 86% um, non-commercial fixed wing. And it's not only VFR pilots, one third of these accidents are instrument rated pilots. So even if you do have instrument, you want to keep proficient because a third of the accidents VFR and time C happens with instrument rated pilots. And I can share with you a few stories of when I flew with instrument rated pilots who in their training mostly train with foggles and very few hours into actual MC. There was one departure we took off from Watsonville and I'll share that in our last wing seminar. But in this particular departure, the pilots got confused on how to read the plate. And all of a sudden he put us in a 60 degrees bank diving on the departure on a takeoff and if i wasn't there in that moment you just took over and says my control that plane would not be here today and this is a instrument rated pilot so keeping up proficiency being really good what you're doing getting a lot of actual imc training with a certified flight instructor or someone who's very well experienced flying an actual mc is going to help keep you safe question here yep um, is there any breakdown that you um, know top of your mind in terms of what phase of flight those yeah. accidents mm -hmm. happen? Is it all of them? Is it takeoffs? Is it cruise flight? Yeah, so the question is, is there a breakdown of what phase of flight does accidents usually happen? The biggest ones is departure, taking off from the airport, and the approach coming into landing. Mm -hmm. During cruise, most people are generally fine because they're high. <laughs> they're over terrain, ATC is vectoring them. They're keeping other aircrafts separate from them or keeping them separate from other aircraft. So in the cruise, it's mostly pretty safe depending on what the terrain, where you're flying. But it's the departure and approaches are usually where the highest rate of accidents are. So I'm going to share with you an NTSB accident report. This happened at Half Moon Bay in 2012. This is a sport pilot. He was 70 years old, 75 years old guy about to fly to see his friend. Um, he took off at 5.15 a.m. local. At the time, the reported visibility is three-quarter mile visibility, miss, and there was 300 foot of overcast ceiling. So this would be I have our condition. And he's a sport pilot, non-instrument rated. He took off within a few seconds, the plane start banking and descending, and they found the wreckage. So this is what his plane looked like before the accident. And after the accident, all they can see is the frames of the, the plane. The plane crashed at the edge of the Half Moon Bay Airport to the right of their runway. And when they decipher what happened, the NTSB conclusion was he got spatial disorientation and loss of control. A lot of time when I train my instrument pilots and I take them into actual IMC, I'm usually expecting weird reaction because there's usually some weird reaction that happens. For example, I'll take a pilot into actual IMC on the descent, no, we're stable, we're well controlled. As soon as we get close to the clouds, the pilot will start banking to the left pitching up and pulling back the power. <laughs> He's doing everything to put us into a stall and then eventually a spin. <laughs> and I took over control and told him, yeah, you gotta keep, <laughs> keep flying. You're stable, don't do weird stuff when you enter and exit the clouds. But this is our human limitation. We're not built to fly into clouds. It's something that we need to train for. So according to the FAA, there's an advisory circular on pilot spatial disorientation. And they say surface references, natural horizon may sometimes be obscure, although visibility may be above visual flight rules minimum. So perfect V of our conditions. And if you can't see the horizon, that can be considered actual IMC. In fact, when I was flying in the jet job, anytime we can't see the horizon, even if it's reported VFR, we lock that as actual IMC. Lack of natural horizon or surface reference is common over on over water flights at nights and at night in extremely sparsely populated areas or low visibility conditions. 
a sloping cloud formation, obscure horizon, dark scene spread with ground lights and stars. Geometric patterns of ground lights can provide an accurate visual. And the disoriented pilot may place the aircraft in a dangerous attitude. So this is our biggest concern when we're flying in low visibility conditions. So uh, let's question. Ahead. Yep. Uh, so uh, if you if you are flying above the cloud deck, so VFR on top, would mm -hmm. that be considered actual IMC with with regards to can you see the horizon? Assuming the visibility is otherwise good. I have to look at the regulation. Uh, do you know, Taylor? I don't think that that's actual IMC. Uh, what I'm referring to is flying pitch dark Mm -hmm. and right where you can't see anything so you don't know how to keep your plane straight up right and there's a letter of interpretation on that but if there's a layer of cloud underneath and you can use that to keep the plane right side up mm -hmm. then i don't think it's going to consider actual imc right. thank you so why learn ifr if you never plan to fly into the clouds so put in the chat box if this resonates with you or you've experienced this before. Reason number one is the sun is in your eyes. I don't know why, but half of the time when I fly in the afternoon, the sun is always in my eyes coming into the landing. <laughs> Last time I flew into Livermore, we're five miles from the runway at Livermore, an airport that I'm so incredibly used to. We cannot see the runway at all. <laughs> and it's even worse if your sun windshield is dirty <laughs> you didn't clean the windshield and you have the sun in your eyes it's pretty much impossible to see and the other days i was flying into half moon bay perfectly clear sky it's reported via bar green dot green dot means go right <laughs> but we are coming in and the sun is right in our eyes coming into this landing i cannot see the runway I was really thankful that I had the instrument approach loaded that day because that gave me peace of mind. And that peace of mind means everything to me when I'm flying. I want to know that I'm safe. Read us in number two. Not only is the sun in your eyes, sometimes you just can't see well because of haze, mist, fog, smoke. Um, many times during the California summer, there could be a wildfire that spark up and suddenly this perfect clear sky that they reported 10 miles visibility just close up on you and the visibility suddenly becomes six statue miles and then three statue miles and you go where is the runway rain if you are flying in high precipitation moisture rich conditions and it start raining you lose sight immediately i was coming into an approach in canada and the rain was super hard we could not see the runway until we're short final we're mm -hmm. like a few feet from the threshold and that's when i go oh there's the runway <laughs> and that's our minimum and then we landed but it was scary flying in the rain any pollution can affect your ability to see well Reason number three, if this resonates with you, the lights are too bright. I was flying into Boston, Massachusetts, coming into the landing, could not find a runway. <laughs> the whole city is completely lit up. Then approach tells me, uh, do you see the Airbus 320 in front of you? You're number two. I go, no, sir, I see no Airbus 320. <laughs> and he says, it's right in front of you. I said, sorry, sir, the lights are so bright. So there are some moments, especially at nights, where the lights are just really bright. You can't find a runway. Sometimes it's too dark. That's the opposite. <laughs> Sometimes even when I'm on downwind in San Jose International, I can't see the runway. I have to turn base and final before I can clearly see it. So using my instrument approach is, is extremely helpful. I was flying into San Francisco International in a jet at night when it was raining and we had to fly over the water. Well, that was pretty scary. I can't see the runway. I can't see very much of anything. It's super dark. The lights are not very bright until you get really close to it. So instrument, super helpful, even if it's reported VFR. Number five, confusing airspace. How many people are scared of going into Bravo, especially someplace like LAX, right? Or if you're ever flying into Dallas, Raleigh, New York airspace, the airspace is super confusing. 
the VPI ad bar, you ignore all your space. It doesn't matter. <laughs> ATC tells you exactly what to do. It's a game of Simon Says. So you don't have to worry about airspace. You're not worried about busting any altitude. Um, number six is you have a live automated instructor. So let's say you haven't flown in a little bit and you just really wish you had some guidance. IFR is that guidance for you. It's basically tell you, hey, a little to the left, oh, no, to the right. Okay, you're just right. A little high, a little low. So this is your live automated instructor that guides you into this perfect approach. And number seven, because you have this guidance of this instructor, you can fly better with a stabilized approach. A lot of people are not sure what the concept of stabilized approach is. They hear the words, <clears throat> but here's the FAA definition of a stabilized approach is when you're able to, you do a stabilized approach to avoid experiencing loss of control is when you establish maintains a constant angle glide path. So you're staying, you're staying on that glide path toward a predetermined point on the landing runway. A lot of VFR pilots, their glide paths all over the place, up and down, up and down, and they're landing somewhere on the runway. Right? That's not a stable approach. You want to be a constant descent rate, landing on a well-defined spot on the runway. And you have to maintain a constant final descent airspeed and configuration. Any questions so far about reasons to learn and apply IFR, even if you're going to apply in VMC VFR conditions? Cool. So here is a myth that a lot of people have in their mind that IFR is really difficult to learn and is really difficult to remember and stay proficient. Uh, my opinion is it's simple if you keep the first things first. So I'm gonna teach you first things first, how three keys that I was sharing with you in the beginning. If you can keep these three keys first thing first in your mind, you can fly any approaches transition into any aircraft. So we're gonna start with on the ground. If you're driving a car on the ground, you operate in a X, Y coordinate, right? You're on the ground and time is flowing through. So the only question you have when you're driving a car is, should I go left or right? Should I go fast or slow? That's it. You exist in this two dimensions plus time. If you're in the air, you have this additional dimension, high or low. Should I go left or right? High or low, fast or slow? Those are the three key fundamental questions. So how do we apply this into our flying? First things first, the first thing you need to make sure you do is know whether you are left or right of the course. Because imagine you're flying an aircraft into a canyon and there's mountains all around you. The first thing you gotta make sure is you're in the middle of the canyon where it's lowest. <laughs> Don't be going way too far left or way too far right, hitting any mountains along the way. That's no good for the plane or for you. So the first thing first is you gotta make sure you're on course. Once you're established on course, the second thing is you gotta make sure you're high enough to clear any obstacle. So high or low is your second priority. Your third priority is fast or slow. How do you control speed? We'll talk about that in a few moments. Here's how it applies when you transition to different aircrafts. A student pilot goes into a trainer aircraft like a Cessna 172. They look at the cockpit and they go, there's so much stuff, I'm overwhelmed. And that would be like going into a house and going, there are so many light switches in here. And going to circuit breaker, wow, there's so many circuit breakers. And that's not a function of a house. The function of a house is to keep you safe from the environments. So the function of a plane is to get you to be able to fly left or right, high or low, fast or slow. So the first thing you do when you go in an airplane is you ask yourself, which of these knobs, lever, instruments, panel, screen, little beautiful shiny things helps tell me if I'm left or right in my course and corrected, if I'm high or low of where my glide path and my route should supposed to be, and if I need to be fast or slow, how do I control the speed? 
I put you in a fancy jet and a very complicated system is really easy to get overwhelmed. And this is how I discovered as key. I had a week to get a type rating. I had to learn a jet. And I got so incredibly overwhelmed by the whole thing. I'm like, how am I supposed to learn how to fly this thing in one week? When I was learning how to fly the multi-engine, I had two weeks, two weeks from the first day I walk into the airplane to my check ride. <laughs> and here's what I distill for myself is if I can just figure out those three things, which of these control left or right and tells me if I'm on course, which gets me high or low and gets on that glide path and which control fast or slow, everything else is a cherry on top. It's a nice to have. This is my fundamental goal as a pilot is to control this. Other things are light switches, environmentals, warm, cold, so let's talk about what your instrument approaches to. These are the fundamental keys before I can go into the instrument because instrument approaches are actually quite easy when you know the fundamental. So the top part of the instrument approach tells you your left or right. That tells you what is your course. The bottom part tells you whether you should be high or low. And then there's this tiny little strip here it tells you the distance you are from the runway. That's how you know whether you should be fast or slow. So if you're far away from the approach, go really, really fast. Maximum rental speed is what I tell you. <laughs> Bull power, back it off a little bit. <laughs> Do whatever allows you to go as fast as you can without breaking the airplane, right? And then lean out the mixture so you can go really, really fast. But as soon as you get close to the approach, slow down a little bit. If you are in a trainer aircraft, you're probably in category A. So back it off and slow down to 90 knot ground speed. Let's we'll talk about why we use ground speed in this case, but back it up and slow it down on the approach to about 90 knot ground speed. Now, when you are a few miles from the runway, back it off the power, start slowing it down because the moment you see the runway, you're probably gonna want to deploy flaps and land. So you don't wanna be going 90 knots the entire time because by the time you see the runway, you're kind of too fast now and it's very hard landing. So super, super fast when you're far, coming to approach, slow down to your approach, ideal speed, category A is 90 knot ground speed, then two miles, start backing off, slowing down to 80 knots or so, and then you're getting yourself down to your approach speed. Why 90 knot ground speed? Because the FA has this climb descent table. This is in your TPP, uh, your procedure chart table. And it tells you, let's say at Half Moon Bay, the glide path is 3.5 degrees. You're going to look in this table and it says if you're applying a ground speed of 90 knot ground speed and the glide path is 3.5 degrees, then you need to keep a descent rate at 555 feet per minute. So this allows you to set how fast are you descending. If you're flying an autopilot plane, you're going to set the descend rate Okay, in your autopilot. It's usually called VS mode. And then you control the power to control how fast or slow you fly on this descent, this fly slope. <clears throat> a lot of people ask me, well, when should I deploy gear and flaps if I am in a complex airplane? Our general rule of thumb, and it changes dependent on context, but if you have a gear airplane, an airplane with a retractable gear, we deploy it before the final approach fix. The reason is because before the final approach fix, you're still kind of high and you're still kind of far. If there's something wrong with your gear, you can tell approach, hey, something wrong with my gear, the green light's not turning on, can you vector me? I'm gonna climb and try to troubleshoot. If you wait too long to deploy the gear, now you're too low, too close to the ground, you're trying to deploy the gear, gear's not coming on, you're freaking out, it's not a good day. So make sure you deploy the gear before the final approach fix and then it helps your configuration. Uh, what about flaps? Why not deploy flaps early? Our logic in our the way that we teach is, if you now have gear and flaps, you have a lot of drag. 
So if your engine quits, if you have an engine problem, if there's some malfunction, you have way too much drag now. Now you got to get rid of them. In this moment of trying to troubleshoot for what's the engine problem, you're trying to climb out, you're an actual MC, that's a lot of work to do. Uh, same with if you're coming into a runway, you can't see the runway and you're going miss. Now you got gear, you got flaps, and you got hit suspend on the GPS button, you got fly to miss approach. That's a lot of work. So in general, we teach gear down before final approach fix and flaps when you see the runway. That can change depending on what kind of aircraft you fly. Uh, the last topic I want to talk about is this concept of <clears throat> ATC says fly at maximum forward speed. You hear this a lot, and you hear it because there's usually a fast plane behind you. What a lot of pilots do is they jam the throttle and they go fast. But I tell my students, maximum forward speed is not the maximum forward speed of the plane, is the maximum forward speed of what you're capable of. Uh, there was an accident that happened where this guy is flying his wife and his daughter behind, and it was late at night. This is an approach he's flown hundreds of times. He's very familiar with this approach. He hears ATC says there's a jet coming behind you. So he jammed the throttle and he's going really, really fast. And in this particular approach, there's the turn. And when he turned at the speed that he was going, he sheared a vertical tail. He broke it off and the plane immediately lost control, crashed and it killed him, his wife, and his daughter was in serious critical condition. So she barely survived that accident. All because he heard, there's a jet behind you. you know, if you hear air ATC says maximum forward speed, there's a jet behind you, and you want to fly 90 ground speed, you tell them, 90 ground speed is my maximum forward speed, and then ask you know, do you want me to be vector around? Be ready to fly a hole, be ready to turn around, but don't push the capability of yourself or your aircraft just for ATC. A lot of people relationship with ATC is boss and employee. ATC says whatever, I do exactly what they say, or parent and child. ATC tells me I do what I say. What I teach my students is you want to think of ATC relationship with respect to you as adult to adult. I'm going to negotiate for what I want. I'm going to ask for what I want. Keep in mind that most ATC controllers are not pilots at all. They're just regular people who are trained on how to communicate with aviation controlling talk. So negotiate for what you want. Don't treat it as parent and child. I do exactly what ATC says. Other things that I notice IFR pilots tend to do is they over prioritize communicating with ATC and stop flying the airplane. So your priority, first things first, fly the plane. Talk to them later, they'll get annoyed with you. It's okay, <laughs> so sorry, but it's better that you fly safely. So remember the three keys, keep first things first. That's your first code word for today is the three keys. And bonus, if in your form, you tell me what the three keys are, but keep the first thing first. So let's go into the flight plan and how we plan the approach. I have students who tell me, you know, it looks like the really experienced pilot, they don't do any planning at all. And I'm really struggling with this approach. I must suck at this. And I tell them that's not true. The really highly experienced pilots, we still spend hours and hours looking over approaches. Even in when I was flying for corporate in the jet world, we would spend two hours, three hours the night before studying the approaches, especially if it's any brand new approaches. We're doing our calculations or performance. We're thinking things through thoroughly. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. It's like if you're watching a duck swim, the duck looks really peaceful and calm on the surface, and then underneath the feet is like prowling really, really fast. Well, that's what you want to be as an IFR pilot is be super calm on the surface and then constantly be thinking, right? The day before, the night before, the weeks before, planning, thinking things through. Nothing happens because we're just, oh, we're just 
you know, we see the approach and we fly it. Um, okay, so let's look at how you would flight plan from Reho View to Hapoon Bay. One of the easiest ways to do that is using the route advisor. And you can see this is a four flight feature, uh, but I think there are other websites that can show you the route advisors as well. And here you have two options. You can have OSI is the which side you are to a fix called tails. And this path you can see highlighted in blue puts you over the ocean. And this path has been cleared over 141 times over the month. Okay. And then we look at this other path, OSI to Zumda. Well, that path put you over land. And that's been clear 74 times total. So the question you ask yourself is, do I want to fly over land or over water? <laughs> right. And if you're in a single engine aircraft, your survival rate <laughs> of landing on land is much better than you know, landing on the ocean. So for me, I generally choose the route over land. That gives me the best outs, the best option. But what I also look at when I look at the route advisor is I get really familiar with the fixed name. So for example, if this is what I filed, but ATC changed my approach and gives me a different clearance, like instead of giving me Jumda, which is what I filed, they tell me to fly toward tails, which is another GPS fix. I'm familiar with what they're talking about. A lot of students will look at me like, huh, tails, what's that? But if you just take two seconds to look at the route advisor and look at the different names, like if ATC says Ultim, you know that's the GPS fix. If they said Suno, if they says Victor 334, you know that that's one of the option of the routes. So that you're not starstruck when they give you a clearance. You go, I don't know what he just said. <laughs> what word is that? So one of the things that helps me <clears throat> plan the approach is I also look at the fix. But uh, at Hadloom Bay, there are two different approaches you can go. RNAV 1-2 and RNAV runway 3-0. You choose which approach based on the direction of flight. For example, if you're coming from north, coming south, you might choose RNAV 1-2. If you're uh, from north, yeah, going south. And if you're going from south to north, you might go choose RNAV 3-0. But if you look at the uh, RNAV runway 1-2, most of the approach is over the ocean. So now you have to make a decision. Do I want over, do I want to fly over land or water? Other things you have to consider is what's the weather condition? Because the approaches give you different visibility, different minimums. So depending on what the clouds is, for example, and the clouds is at a thousand feet AGL. Maybe you want to pop out the clouds a few hundred feet before you see the runway. That way you have time to adjust your landing. Um, the other thing to notice is there's no circling minimums in these kind of approaches because it's so close to the mountains. So if you're going to fly these approaches, it's a straight in landing. So depending on what the wind is, you're going to choose the approach that you want. Um, one thing that I do note is, for example, the RNAP runway 30, the intermediate fix is Jumda, which just happens to be the same name as what my route advisor says. So if I'm planning to fly over land, I'm going to pick and file Woodside to Jumda because that leads me directly to the RNAP 30 approach into, into Half Moon Bay. Other um, things you want to consider is what altitude are you going to file? A lot of my students just ask me, okay, what approach are we doing today? What altitude should we fly? <laughs> Why not keep it direct and fly toward Jumda? You could do that as well. Um, when a route advisor shows you a route, that's usually what ATC cleared you. So you can file that. Just expect that ATC will likely amend your clearance and tell you to go which side anyway. And then in reality, as soon as you take off, they might tell you fly direct to Jumda. So what you file, what ATC cleared you, and what you actually fly are three different things. Sometimes they're the exact same thing. Sometimes they're completely three different things. 
But usually we file what the route advisors say um, and then keeping in consideration what we want. And then we're aware of what all the other route options are and be ready for any ATC clearance. And then we're ready to fly direct if um, we're giving permission to do that. So great questions. Okay, yeah. Do you know what data is feeding what for flight mm -hmm. is showing cleared? Uh, uh, yeah, most frequently cleared or used? I think it's through the ATC system, but I'm not sure. But okay. I've seen it in um, flightplan.com. Okay. There's another website as well, and it also show route advisor. Okay. Um, the other thing that I notice is when I lead a lot of uh, tower tours, so we'll visit San Jose Tower, Reed Hillview Tower. I also lead tours into NorCal, TRACON, which is in Sacramento. And what I notice is they have a book. Um, ATC have a book that if you want to fly from this location to this location, they have a route that they list. And so that's known as well. There's also tech routes, which are listed in your chart supplements, which also guide you. If you're going to fly from here to here, here's the suggested route. So there are known routes in the database system that ATC likes to clear people if you're going from, one, from point A to point B. Yeah. So on the runway choice, um, you mentioned there were two runways. Would you uh, pick that based on the wind direction? Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's the runway one, two, and three, zero, and two N. Uh, usually, if for me, if the wind is low, less than ten knots, um, maybe less than five knots, then I can expect either the runway. But if the wind is really strong in one direction, I might not even want to fly. So let's say the wind is favoring runway 30, then doing the RNF 30 makes perfect sense. But if the runway is favoring 12, then I'm going to look at how strong the wind is and how much tailwind can I accept on this landing. And if I think that I can make the landing with a little bit of tailwind, then I'll do runway the RNAV 3.0, even though the winds vary 1.2, because I prefer to be inland. And I know that when they do weather forecasts, the wind direction and strength can vary. So I know the wind is going to be shifting. But if the wind is really strong, like above 10 knots, then that may be too strong and I might not even fly. Um, the other thing I noticed, I was flying with another pilot, the RNAV 1.2. So we're flying over the ocean, and that's eerie. <laughs> and I try to ask to stay close inland, and ATC on that day didn't allow us. Maybe it's the way that I asked, or maybe there was a lot of jets flying around. So we're hanging out in the ocean, and I'm just <laughs> counting down a minutes until we go inland. The other thing I noticed about RNAV-1-2 is it gets you really close over the tops of those trees. If you're going to fly that approach, be really careful and never be low on that approach because you are skimming the top of that trees. I noticed runway 30 approach gives you a little bit more clearance. So that's, um, I think, is a little bit safer approach. Uh, <laughs> yep. How, how much of a consideration is the VFR traffic if you're if you're ac accepting tailwind, especially since in Half Moon Bay they have uh, not insignificant amount of no radio traffic? Great question. So um, the question is how much do we have to worry about VFR traffic? Well, if you are flying the approach and it's actual IMC, there's very few VFR <laughs> traffic. But plus, if you have ADSB, you can see the VFR traffic as well. And NorCal would let you know if there's any VFR traffic. And we make a lot of radio calls inbound. If you are flying in a condition where there are a lot of VFR traffic, because it's clear, then you're going to pop out of the clouds really, really fast. And you're going to see them. And in that case, you might break off the approach early and join everyone else like a VFR traffic. And that's a fantastic question. You uh, fly yeah. the route, um, and then if you see one, kind of change around or land your route. Mm -hmm. Are you? Do you have a right as my pilot to sort of push back? Be like, oh, I really want to fly what I what I filed, or do you have to take? 
So the question is, if you follow a route and they give you a different route, could do you have to take what they give you or can you ask for something else? That's where your negotiation skills come in. And you say, well, sir, could I fly direct from this fix to this fix? No. How about if I climb a thousand feet, would that work? What if I wait a little bit? Would you allow me to do that? We do that in the jet all the time. So when we're flying corporate, the most important thing for our passenger is to get from A to B really quick. And they want us to use the least amount of fuel because it's a cheaper flight for them. So we're constantly negotiating, uh, can, we, can I go direct? Can I change my altitude? Can I go higher? Can I go lower? <laughs> I think this is gonna help my fuel burn. This is gonna help us get A to B faster. But ultimately then they can say yes or no. They can say yes or no. And then you make another request. You keep requesting until you get approximately what you want and there's a compromise to it. But from what my experience of ATC across the country, is they will do everything they can to help you out. They're the nicest people in the world. They want to make it easy for you to make your negotiation easier. You want to have the awareness of what everyone else is doing, right? So what helps for me is I look at on my ADSB if you have Sentry or Stratus um, for flight, and I'm looking at where other aircrafts are, and I'm thinking like I am an air traffic controller. What is the most efficient way to organize all these aircraft? And how could I make a request that would be easy for them to say yes, because of where everyone's located? So if you just randomly ask for what you want with no consideration for what anyone else is doing, they might say no. But if you take into account what everyone is doing, they'll say yes. You know, other things, the way you make a request, it's really helpful as well. So sometimes, for example, if I'm training with a student and the student asks for a VFR practice approach to a busy airport, ATC, airport, ATC usually say no. We don't do practice approaches here. But if you just change your language a little bit and you just says, I would like this approach and I would like to land, <laughs> they'll say yes because that's what they do. They help you land. So changing your language a little bit really helps the negotiation works better. A lot of time um, saying a little bit more is helpful or saying a little bit less is helpful. <laughs> you wanna play the poker game of keeping your card close to you and revealing the cards as necessary in the right time. But don't show all your cards all at once because it's easy to say no when you see everything. You just review the card one by one as necessary. That's my negotiating tactics. <laughs> you don't want everyone to know what you have. How can you negotiate? Okay. Yeah. I just had a question. You were saying that one of the approaches means you move the water. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to uh, the illegal and the existence of uh, offshore? I guess. What is the legal yeah, aspect? Well, you have to be within gliding distance of mm -hmm. shore in case of an engine failure. So if you guys putting out in, in the open water at a distance beyond your are you real? Well, that's a good question. In the Part 91 world, there's no specific requirements. Yeah. That. Uh, that's kind of a personal choice for Part 91. They're general aviation operations. So we get to turbine, jets, all that stuff. Higher up as they're running on different operations, scheduled airlines. You're going to have more requirements on uh, black system in general. So, for the people online, the question is. Uh, can ATC put you on an approach that's far away from the shore where you might not be able to glide to land? And what Taylor is saying is in the Part 91, there's usually no regulation around that. If you're flying corporate 135, 121, there are regulations around that, but usually no regulations around gliding distance. Any other questions? Uh, so Bob has a question. <clears throat> Keep your Nordo route requirements. Leave clearance limit in mind when following a simple route. Oh, a reminder. Oh, okay. Keep your, uh, what happens if you lose your radio with uh, what you do, how mm. far you're cleared on your clearance. So that's an importance when you're getting a, a route clearance from ATC. Because that's the reason you do get a, a clearance from ATC, just to tell you basically what happens if you do lose your radio. 
where, where is he expecting you to go? Where you, you know, have to do is where you want to go. I, I think this might have actually been in response to my question about the no radio VFR traffic that li likes to hang out in Halton Bay. Okay. Okay, great. And then the other aspect that Taylor shared, which I think is really important for everyone to hear, is when you give it, when you receive an IFR clearance, that's the game plan that you would do if you lose all radio communications with ATC. So you want to be aware of what that route is. And if you want to learn more about LASCOM, we draw deeper in that in our ground school classes because it's a big topic to, to cover. Um, now, when you're following this flight plan, which altitude would you file? There's a few things that I look at. So I look at the route that we're flying. Right? I'm just drawing a general quick route. What is the MEF, which is maximum elevation figure, which shows me the highest altitude obstacle in this quadrant here, 3,600. Then I'm looking at what's the highest obstacle that I might encounter along my route. I see 2,417. And then I look at my fix for my approach as I'm starting on this approach, 3,800. So I'm gonna choose the biggest number, 3,800 is the biggest number. And then I'm gonna bump it up a little bit because I don't wanna be just at the limit. We're going from east to west, so I'm going to fly an even number. So my option is 4,000 feet or 6,000 feet, right? Because 4,000 feet will put me right there at the limit and 6,000 will give me a little bit extra I just gotta be careful with that and make sure I descend so I'm not diving at the last minute. So I might fall 6,000 feet. <clears throat> Other things we think about in field planning, and this is where a lot of instrument pilots get in trouble on their check ride, but pilots get in trouble in real life too, is when they plan for field, they only plan to fly from A to B. What we like to teach is you need to have at least enough fuel for the departure procedure, getting out of your airport. You gotta fly to the approach itself, fly the entire approach. And then if you can't see the runway, fly the missed approach, plan to hold at least three times because you don't know when ATC is gonna be able to clear you. Now you gotta fly to the ultimate approach and fly the entire approach. And then I like to add, in addition to that, 45 minutes fuel reserve. So it's a huge buffer compared to the FAA regulations, but it will keep you safe because you want to think about the idea that if you're applying actual IMC uh, and not just a practice approach in the VMC condition, you got to apply the departure, apply the entire approach and be ready to go miss <laughs> and go to your alternate maybe do a few holes and fly the approach to the alternate. It's not just straight line distances. And that's where IFR pilots can get in trouble with low fuel, minimum fuel, or no fuel, fuel starvation at the end because they don't plan thoroughly. And just If you take out the fan route segment from your list there, mm -hmm. like all the other stuff, how many more minutes does that usually add to your point five? Well, this would be in addition to that. I know, I know. It yeah. depends on your alternate and how far it is, but maybe an hour, an hour, two hours extra buffer is what I usually have. So 45 plus one or two hours of buffer plus your in route. That's what I would do. Yeah. So let's say it takes an hour for me to fly into Hat Moon Bay. I might give an extra an hour of fuel, just in case I need to go alternate. And then I might add an extra 45 minutes just because I didn't you know, measure the fuel correctly, I didn't lean properly, just give me that extra buffer. But an hour or two hours, if you're flying local, um, is a good ballpark, but I would do planning, you know, depending where your alternate is, of course. Okay, so here's how I brief an IFR approach on the ground, the plate on the ground. This is what Taylor and I would discuss for hours before we even plan this flight. And then we would brief 
in the air. So the first thing I breathe is, number one, I make sure that I have a current plate. Number two, that I'm looking at the right plate. You'd be surprised how many instrument pilots I fly with where they're using the wrong plate. <laughs> and then they go, where are you going? <laughs> and I said, I'm supposed to go left. Uh, no, you're not. That's not the plate. <laughs> so make sure you have the right plate. Then at the number three, I'm looking to see which equipment I need. So in this case, I need a WASP if I want to fly to LPV. Number four, I'm looking at the frequency. And this is where I plan my ABM setup. This is not something that I come up in the air and I go, oh, this number looks good over here. I strategize. I'm like a chess master before an IFR flight plan, especially to a brand new airport. And if I know the condition is actual IMC and I know that there's a chance we might have to go miss, I strategize on how I'm going to set up my avionics on the ground. So, for example, for me, I like if I have two COM radios, COM1 is to talk and COM2 uh, is listen. So I might put in NorCal uh, as I'm coming along and then have Moonbay CTAF as standby. That way, when I'm ready to swap to CTAF, I have that available. COM2, I like to listen. So I may put in the weather for the destination airport and then the weather for my alternate airport. If I was flying into Half Moon Bay, my alternate might be San Jose. Giant runway, really close by, super nice, they'll let me land. Probably won't do San Francisco. They would uh, <laughs> shoo you away unless it's an absolute emergency. So San Jose is a really good alternate. <clears throat> In my nav, I. Nav one might be GPS because it's a GPS approach. And nav two, I might put an alternate. And in this case, I might put Woodside VR, which is the closest VR nearby, and San Jose VR in case I need a go miss. So I'm strategizing my avionics on the ground. Uh, number five is I'm looking left or right. This tells me what is my course. Where is the course? Am I flying over land, over water? Am I flying near the mountains? Where's the mountains? As I'm coming into Half Moon Bay on RNAV runway 30, the mountains on my right side. So I know if I deviate from the course, deviate to the left, <laughs> toward the ocean. Don't deviate to the right, that's where the mountains is. I'm thinking, where are my terrains? Worst case scenario, go west. That's the ocean, probably less stuff for me to hit out there. <laughs> yes, I start just losing control somehow. Uh, number six is I'm briefing what are my altitudes. This is how I route plan. Number seven is I'm planning for my speed, how fast I'm going to apply this approach, and then what are my minimums? Because I'm planning to be able to touch down very stable and control. And number eight is I'm looking at the runway. Something I brief about the runway is how long it is. If I'm flying a trainer aircraft, 172, I'm going to want a runway at least 3,000 feet. If it's shorter than that, I'm going to note that this is a short runway from my particular aircraft, and I better be on top of my speed and control and be able to do a short field landing. Otherwise, I'm going to fly past the runway and overrun. And there are many case accidents at Half Moon Bay where people land and overrun and crash into the grass. So plan out how long the runway is. Other things I think about is if it's a really long runway, like if I'm landing in San Jose International, then I can keep up my speed because I have a really long runway to land on. I don't have to be super, super slow coming into approach. Anything? Uh, just Steve on the chat had a comment. Uh, recommend putting the CTAP sometimes and come to just to listen to it in advance of NorCal passing you over so you're kind of aware of traffic that's going on. Absolutely. Uh, is it something you would consider? I think it's a brilliant idea and that's what I often do. Once I get the Half Moon Bay weather, I get rid of that or maybe I put it in a standby if um, I'm definitely going to plan to land. And then I put in the CTAP and COM2, and I'm just monitoring. I want to hear what other people are doing. I'm listening to NorCal and COM1 monitoring on COM2, looking also at my ADSB, seeing where traffic is. A lot of times my students tell me, I don't know what runway the wind's favoring because I can't 
here to Ada's because we're too far or there's a mountain and we can't pick up Ada's. And I tell them there are a million ways you can figure out what the traffic pattern is and where everyone's going without needing to hear Ada's. One, there are apps on your cell phone where you can get digital Ada's on your phone. Two, if you have your ADS-B and you look at the little icons of all the aircraft, you can really tell where everyone's landing is usually in whatever traffic most people are taking off and landing in. So that's a really good idea of what runway is being preferred. You can see people traffic pattern as well if it's a busy airport and you can go, okay, so this is how I'm going to vector myself in. But definitely I love the idea of monitoring COM2. And then having maybe San Jose, my alternate aid is on standby. Once I get Half Moon Bay, I was, and I know what that weather is. Something that Taylor and I talk a lot about when we flight plan IFR is what's the miss? A lot of people don't think too much about a miss, but if you look at a miss at Half Moon Bay, especially the RNAV 30, it puts you over the ocean. <laughs> You're flying the Sims hold for five nautical miles over the ocean at um, whatever altitude they give you. That's scary. So I'm going to plan, and we would discuss ahead of time, if we have to go miss, we're climbing, we're going toward the ocean just to avoid the mountains to our left side. But then immediately, as soon as we get ATC, we're going to ask for vector because no way are we going to hold over the ocean for five nautical miles. That seems crazy. <laughs> that doesn't seem safe for us. We're going to ask for vector. Can you give an alternate miss? Can you vector us back inland? Can you vector us to a VFR airport? <clears throat> so I'm already thinking of how I will negotiate with ATC before I even take off. It's not something that I think about in the moment of, because in the moment of, it's too late. You're nervous, you're not sure what's happening. It seems crazy. <laughs> yeah, seems it's crazy. Um, if you, than, yeah. If you go missed, uh, uh -huh. do you plan for tr to try again, or do you just assume you're, you're going to turn away to your alternative uh, destination? Fantastic question. So if you go missed, do you plan to try again? It depends. It depends on why you had to go miss. Were you missed because the clouds were so solid and there's no chance of being able to fly that? Or did you go miss because you somehow messed up the approach if you are too high or too low or too left or too right and you just got unstable? That if you can get yourself more stable, if you have a crew, get the other crew to help you out, then maybe you have a chance. But if you were to do that, I only try the approach twice and then I go away, go to an alternate. Just know that now you're burning up the fuel reserve that you have. But it depends on why you went and missed. If it was the weather, it was solid, if you don't think you have any chance of trying, just go away, find an alternate, go to your alternate S plan. Mm -hmm. But if it was because you made the mistake you just couldn't fly straight and level for some reason because you were distracted you know you're playing with four flight too long and you forgot to control the aircraft and you had to go miss because you went full scale reflection for example then you might if you had another pilot talk with them try again mm -hmm. and if you if you go missed for your own reasons as in the approach was not good uh, would you still ask atc for a diff for for uh, vectors to avoid hanging out over, over the ocean absolutely i would ask the atc i would say something like hey i had to go miss i would like to try to approach again can you vector me back to jumda which mm -hmm. is my, um intermediate fix and uh, then i start the approach again so, so in you, if you ask for vectors, just in practical terms, you give them a suggestion for where you want to be vector to make it easier for them to say yes. Yeah, and easier for you too. You want to go where you want to go. Right. <laughs> because if you just ask for a vector, they'll put you anywhere they want you to go, which might not be where you want to go. So you might ask, can you vector me towards this fix? I like to try this approach again. But that's, yeah, great question. Is context dependent? It's how close were you? You have a chance. If you know you definitely don't have a chance, or if for some reason 
um, you're really tired. Uh, it was a stressful approach. It's really turbulent. When you went into that particular cloud, super turbulent, you might go to your alternate. Even if you think you have a chance, it might be beyond your capability. So just ask for vector to a VBAR area, it's a VFR airports, and then just land VFR. Mm -hmm. But don't force yourself to fly an approach just because that's what you plan. You want to think of uh, your human capability as well. And not just what's the aircraft's capable of or what's the approach is capable of. Other thing that students often ask me is, I really struggle with radio. I don't know why I suck at radio. <laughs> and I tell them, did you write down what you're about to say? Did you write down what they will say to you? Have you practiced the script? Because the way air traffic controller work is there's a very well-defined structure, what they will say to you and what they expect you to respond. And 80% of it, they follow that. 20%, they'll throw you a surprise. But it's like if you're going to McDonald's, you know they'll probably ask you, do you want fries with that? You go to a grocery store, paper or plastic. <laughs> you, know, you go to a fast food and they ask for a drink, Coke or Pepsi. So there's a very well-defined expected script that ATC follows. And you can write this down, plan it, practice it. If you struggle with pronunciation, I am an immigrant. I, English is my second language. I struggle with pronunciation for a very long time. I just sit there and I practice my communication, how to pronounce words. Sometimes I struggle with certain words. And then I just practice that. So here's a radio communication script that I might write down. Uh, if I'm coming into a jumda, flying the approach, I'm expecting NorCal at some point to say, fly this heading, maintain this altitude, clear for the RNF 30 to Half Moon Bay, frequency change approved, close your flight plan in the air on the ground. I know they'll say that. They might use slightly different words, but that's the meaning of what they're about to say. So I write the script down and I practice it. I practice how I would respond. And maybe they say something different, but most of the time, this is what they say. And it's no surprise to me. Um, and then I plan what I'm going to say to CTAF. Right? If I switch over to Half Moon Bay traffic, what am I going to say? I write it down. Half Moon Bay traffic, Skyhawk 54102, 10 miles southeast, inbound straight in 30, RNAV 30 approach, Half Moon Bay. Then Half Moon Bay traffic, 54102, 5 miles final, 30, Half Moon Bay, and Mavic. I use the fix to prompt me to know when to call Half Moon Bay. So on the ground, I plan which fix is about 10 miles from the runway, which fix is about five miles from the runway, and then I call it three miles, and then I call short final. So I let non-towered airport traffic know long before I arrive, 10 miles, five miles, three miles, and then if I'm entering traffic, downwind, base, final, if I'm straight in, and I call final. But I write them down the script, I practice beforehand. That way I keep my radios short, concise, and very clear. Other things that Taylor and I discussed extensively before we fly IFAR is crew resource management. We discussed this beforehand. You do this in the corporate world as well in the airline. Who does what, exactly what the role, who says what. There is no confusion in the aircraft. And if there is, it's minor. For example, the pilot flying, so if I'm flying the plane and Taylor's monitoring, I fly the plane, I'm making sure I hit my three keys. Am I left or right of the course? Am I high or low of my altitude I'm supposed to be at? And am I fast or slow, am I on speed? Taylor, the pilot monitoring is confirming, am I hitting the numbers I need to be? And if I'm not, he's gonna tell me, hey, you need to go left a little bit. That's what your CFI does during your instrument training. Because <laughs> they're the pilot monitoring in this role. The pilot flying is controlling the aircraft, navigating. But the pilot monitoring is monitoring the navigation. If we have to go miss, if we want to go to an alternate, the pilot monitoring is figuring out the alternate. It's figuring out what heading should we fly, which fix should we go to. 
pilot flying is constantly scanning the instrument, looking through the pilot monitoring, is programming the avionics, putting in the frequency for the GPS, the iOS, the localizer, setting the altimeter setting, putting in the heading, that setting the heading indicator with respect to the compass, and anything that the pilot monitoring is doing, he says it out loud to the pilot flying knows and can confirm that that's what's happening. The pilot monitoring is making all the radio calls, pilot flying is just complying. Both pilots is monitoring the system, engine, oil temperature, oil pressure, making sure everything is flying. The pilot flying will brief the approach. The pilot monitoring is confirming the approach and everything is brief and come into agreement. The pilot monitoring would read the checklist. So he would say something like, before our takeoff checklist, mixture is rich. The pilot flying push the mixture to rich and says, mixture is rich. The pilot monitoring read the checklist, pilot flying is doing the checklist. Pilot monitoring retrieves any information that's necessary. Pilot flying is asking for the information, but he's not looking for anything. They're just flying the airplane. So you have that roles really well defined with whoever you're flying with. And I recommend, at least for me, anytime I fly an actual IMC, I always have two pilots. No matter how proficient, experienced you are, for some reason, there's usually something that happens that makes you nervous, makes your hair stands on the back of your, you know, your skin. And it's really nice to have peace of mind of having another pilot splitting the workload and being super clear on how you're gonna split the workload. And then what I like to do is practice these procedures before I even take off. So the way I do that is I think of myself as a movie director. If you're a movie director, you control the script, what each of the actor and actress do, what they say, how it happens, the whole movie, what happens to the, to the plane before takeoff, after takeoff, you're the movie director. If any time during the, mov the movie that you're scripting, you don't know what to do, like, I don't know what heading I should fly. What altitude should I be? What should I say here? You got to work back and figure out the entire movie before you take off. So you got to script out everything that happens. ATC might change it a little bit, but you got to have an idea of what your movie is going to be. What are your actors and actresses going to say? What are they going to do in this movie? Don't just go because, and then just, wait to see what ATC tell you, you gotta have a plan. Because how can you negotiate if you don't have a plan, if you don't know what you want, right? So have a plan. What I like to tell my student is chair fly or finger fly. So we put our finger over the entire route and we talk about a route. Where are you stuck in this movie where you're not sure what to do? Work backward, solve this confusion that you have and continue. Then if you know it's a difficult approach, fly in the sim. So for example, when we're doing, I was doing the type rating training, the approaches that we would fly is into LaGuardia, New York. We know that's a difficult approach. We know that the ATC communication is super difficult. Um, at other training center, they fly the Aspen approach. That's an extraordinary difficult approach is a vertical dive as soon as you meet the initial approach fix. We fly in a sim, we train hours and hours, making sure that we can fly the approach when the time comes. And then I like to sit in the airplane. Don't even turn the airplane on, just sit in the airplane, touching all the knobs and the levers. So if I need to add the mixtures rich, I can reach over and feel the knobs and push it forward. I know if I want to turn on the lights for my landing lights, probably on my left side. So I sit in the aircraft and I familiarize with where all the knobs and the levers are. And I am very well familiar with the aircraft. So for example, when I was training for my commercial multi-engine check ride, which I had only two weeks to learn how to fly this aircraft, I sit in the airplane for 30 hours, never turning it on. I'm just touching, practicing, all the maneuvers and visualizing the movie in my head so that there's no confusion on exactly what to do. 
All right. So, now, uh, question, do you never fly single pilot IFR? Not if I'm flying into actual IMC. That's just my personal minimums. I see. You could do it if you want to. But my personal minimums, if I know I'm going to the clouds, I have two people in the plane. And the other person, I want them to be <laughs> provision pilot. Mm. Do, the, do you do you require them to be IFR rated then as well, because so, so they understand, or could that be a VFR pilot? I love these questions. Wonderful. We'll talk about in risk management. How do you stack the deck in your favor? But having an instrument rated, well experienced, proficient pilot is, you know, your best deal as long as you talk about your roles and make sure that you don't step on each other's toes. That's really helpful. Um, if I know I'm flying to actual IMC with a student who's learning IFR, then I want to make sure that I know how well they fly and that they're able to hold heading, altitude, <laughs> all the things that will help us stay out of terrain. Because to teach someone while in the soup is really, really hard. I would do that in perfect weather condition where I can see everything. But if we're going into the soup and it's solid, I want a really good pilot with me. Mm -hmm. Yep. For, for practice, do you, mm -hmm. some airports have multiple runways and multiple approaches for each runway. Mm -hmm. Do you memorize everything, your every approach your plane is capable of before flying to that airport? Absolutely. So the question is, there are some airports with many different approaches on many different runways. Do you look at all the approaches? I, For me, I do. I study every single possible approaches I can do for that airport and for my alternate because that's my negotiation card. Right? How do I negotiate with ATC if I don't know what cards I'm holding? I want to know what all my possible options are. If I'm in trouble, I'm going to ask for the other approach. Or if I want to get there quickly, right, I'm going to switch over to another approach. But I want to know all my playing cards before I step into the poker game. I don't play card games, but I'm just imagining if I were to play a poker game, <laughs> that's what I would do. Um, any questions online or in person so far? Good. Thumbs up if you're following me. All right, so I'm gonna bring you into a real flight that Taylor and I did. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please don't make me feel alone here. <laughs> Thank you for participating online, love it. I'm gonna take you through the weather briefing that Taylor and I did on this particular flight. Um, the first thing we noticed on this flight is, is reported IFR, and we were actually looking to practice actual IMC, so we're going, yes, it's IFR, is what do we expect? We look at METAR. Now, a lot of people, when they look at METAR, they look horizontally across. What I teach my student is look vertically down. And what I mean by this is, I don't just want to know what's happening at Reed Hill View and Half Moon Bay. I want to know what the conditions are across the area because I'm looking for what's the stability of the weather. For example, at Reed Hill View, wind calm. E16, low IFR, okay, but the wind is five knots and is going from one four. Tracy is calm, Watsonville is calm, Livermore is four knots. What do I know about stability the air, of the air right now? It's pretty calm, it's really stable. I'm going straight down. Calm, calm, 10 knots wind, that's the max I've seen so far, six knots, calm wind, five knots, seven knots, five, five knots. So I know the weather, very low wind across the area, not just my destination airport. So I can guess that it's not likely to change very rapidly. Then I'm looking at the visibility. I send 10 statue mile, five, 10, three, where is the visibility and how is it changing, right? It's low along the coastline, Salinas, Monterey, but it's pretty clear inland in the coast. So that tells me this is a very stable day. We just have marine layer and that's what's causing the IFR condition, but the wind is relatively calm. So I can choose any runway. I can land on one, two or three, zero, probably just fine. 
and we'll check the water as we go along. <clears throat> Other things I look at is the tap. I, again, look vertically across the entire area, see how strong is the wind. Is the wind going to be better or worse? Is the water going to be better or worse? So if I look at the tap at San Jose, 11 knots, then 8 knots, then 4 knots. Okay, the wind is dying down. It's not going to get stronger. I don't see any crazy gusts coming on because not only do I want to go half moon bay, I want to be able to come back. <laughs> so I want a relatively good wind. The wind, 9 knots, 14, but then it comes down to 5 knots. So now I have a really good idea of weather is pretty stable. I'm looking at Pyrup. Now I notice that a Pyrup here is over Monterey. It's not where Half Moon Bay is, but it's the only Pyrup I have. So let's take a look at what I know about what's reporting in Monterey. Bay is 500, top is 1,400. So I'm understanding this is one Pyrup, the next Pyrup, 500, top 1,400, 500, top 1,500. I'm guessing, based on the marine layer that these pilots see at Monterey, about 1,000 feet cloud layer, if I'm just setting at 500 feet per minute, I should pop through the clouds in about two minutes. So I'm not hanging in a suit for hours. It's a very quick in and out, in and out. And that's good. If you haven't flown actual MC in a long time, in and out is your best friend. Uh, if you want more experience and if you're with a highly experienced pilot, longer time in a soup is okay, as long as you are not worried about icing. Um, other things that Taylor and I look at on this particular flight to Hapoon Bay, there are webcams. Uh, there's a uh, webcams at Sam's Chowder House, and there's webcam at Hapoon Bay Airport as well. So we just look and see where the clouds are. And then we file an IFR flight plan using four flight. Many different ways to file IFR flight plans. We like four flights, pretty straightforward, easy, press the button, file. And, and the amendment, it pops through in four flight as well. I know other people use different iPad system. Um, my favorite is four flight because it has a lot of functionalities that I really, enjoy and when you train with me an instrument i share a lot of that with my students as well but you know other apps have positive negatives where were those cameras again there's one at sam's chowder house and then there's one at half moon bay airports uh, and there, there might be others as well you can look up webcams near half moon bay airport on google and oftentimes you find webcams when we are flying into idaho in the back country uh, yeah, Wendy is your friend. Um, when we were flying to Idaho in the back country, we look a lot for webcams because sometimes the airports don't have ADIS AWAS, so webcams were extremely helpful. Uh, Taylor is putting in the links to some of the webcams as well. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, all right, let's fly the approach. So this is what happened in the approach. Here's how we get an IFR clearance from a towered airport. We file in for a flight, and we're on the ground at Reed Hill View, and we say Reed Hill Ground, Skyhawk 54102, aerodynamic picking up IFR clearance to Half Moon Bay with information echo. Okay. We just keep it nice and short. A lot of people add more things in a radio communication. The more you add, the more stuff you have to remember. <laughs> so I like to say picking up IFR into Half Moon Bay. Here's the ACC response to us on that day, and this is usually their clearance to Half Moon Bay. If you're taking it off from Reed Hillview, clears Half Moon Bay Airport on departure, turn left heading 290, radar vectors for San Jose VR, and then Woodside VR direct, climb maintain 3000, expect 5005 minutes, departure frequency 121.3, swap 4553. So beforehand, we work out our shorthand radios, right? our craft clearance, KHAF, that's Half Moon Bay is where we're clear. L is for left turn, 290 heading, three letters digit, SJC, OSI, indicates for us as VR, altitude. I just write three and five. A lot of people write three, zero, 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 
five zero zero zero. You could write all the zeros, but then <laughs> you usually get really behind in the clearance. So I just write three and five. And then for my subscript, that's the time. So five minutes, I would write subscript. I write the frequency 121.3 and 4553. I work out my shorthand before I get an eye for a clearance. When we depart on this flight, perfectly clear day, as expected. One thing to do note is if you are doing IFR departures from Reed Hillview, it's only available from 3-1 left and 3-1 right. You can't do IFR departure from 1-3. We asked the tower why. Uh, they said it was because they haven't worked out the plate the departure procedure from 1-3, and there was FAA regulations around clearance and stuff like that. So they just allow 3-1, which means that if even if the wind is preferring 1-3, they will always clear you an IFR on 3-1. You gotta make sure that you can accept whatever tailwind, if any, on that day. There was a pilot, a crew that was about to take off on uh, runway 3-1 for an IFR departure, and the tailwind was 10 knots. And on that day, our instructor, our chief pilot, tells uh, Tower, can you tell that pilot and that plane to check the weather? <laughs> and they check the weather and go, oh my goodness, the tailwind is too strong. So they departed VFR on the runway 13, and then they pick up IFR in the sky. So just make sure you know that you can only depart 3-1 and that you can accept any tailwind on that day, if any. So this is our departure, clear. As we're flying, you want to stay ahead of the plane. The things that I'm briefing myself as the pilot flying, I am expecting traffic advisory. Check out for this plane. And the way that I stay ahead of the game is I have my sentry on, and I look at all the aircraft near me that's flying toward me or near my altitude. because. I'm listening for any traffic advisory. If I know there's an aircraft coming at me near my altitude, I know ATC is about to say 54102, there's a traffic 12 o'clock. So I'm expecting to hear that. It's not a surprise to me. I'm not in the middle of program I'm programming GPS and then suddenly ATC talks and I'm surprised and I have to stop what I'm doing. I'm anticipating traffic advisory if there's any aircraft near me. I'm anticipating radar vector if there's aircraft coming at me. I'm planning ahead. That way, if I'm programming in my GPS, doing my checklist, I do that after I get traffic advisory. So I'm not stopping in the middle and now I forgot where I was. I got picked up back again. Um, I have an IFR procedure checklist. When I started out flying IFR, the picture on the right is my checklist because I wasn't quite sure what exactly I was doing. So I just write down, you know, make sure you check your ATIS, put in your altimeter, make sure you figure out what runway, put in your avionics, brief the approach, activate. When I see the runway, call it out, I see the runway, if I have to go around. Um, and then as I fly more and more, I condense it to three steps because I found out that <laughs> my brain only remembered things in groups of three. So now my checklist with more experience now is ABC. I tell my students, have you done your ABC? As you're coming close to an airport, your A is listen to ATIS or AWAS and set your altimeter. Because if your altimeter is set incorrectly, your entire approach is shot. <laughs> it's completely wrong. So the first thing you got to do is make sure, one, I can fly the approach, right? You have the visibility and ceiling required, and uh, I can land. The wind is not too strong for me. And then I set my altimeter so that I hold my IFR altitude clearance. Then my B is bill bug brief. I build the approach, which means I put it in the GPS system. I bug which means I remind myself of all the critical numbers, like this is my minimum hard deck. Don't go below this altitude. And then I brief the approach and see once I've done everything is checklist. So I do my ABCs when I'm flying IFR. Here's how I brief an IFR approach plate in the air. 
A lot of students and IFR pilots briefly approach plates like they're at an auction, <laughs> just reading off stuff, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, did you understand anything you just said? <laughs> and they'll brief this whole approach, and then they turn to me and says, what's my minimums again? I'm like, what was the whole purpose of that? <laughs> We're not at an auction. So the way I brief the approach in the air is I'm coaching myself on how I'm going to fly this approach. So first, I make sure the approach is valid and is the right approach, and I have the, uh, the equipment I need. So in this case, the WAS, if I'm flying the LPV, then I make sure that in my building of the avionics that I've set it up as I plan. And when I'm briefing, I'm just briefing to make sure that I put in the right number. A lot of people put in one number off, you know, number could be 127.27 and they put 127.72 and they, they spend 10 minutes trying to figure out why they can hear the AWAS and it's because they swap the number. So in my approach briefing in the air, I confirm, okay, I put in the AWAS, 127.27. My NorCal, I'm already talking to them, 135.1. I have Unicom ready. Maybe it's in COM2 monitoring. If I've already listened to AWAS 122.8, or I have it in standby in COM1, getting ready to talk, getting ready to talk to CTAF. And then I brief what I'm doing now and what I'm doing next. So now I'm flying toward Jumda. I want to be above 3,800 feet. And then I'm flying Wally. That's my final approach fix, 3,300 feet. Gliding down to fly slope minimums is 381 feet. Right? So I'm coaching myself, left or right, high or low, and I'm coaching myself, all right, by jump down, I got to be 90 knot ground speed. Got to slow down 90 knots. At Woolley, I'm going to tell traffic I'm 10 miles away. At Malvik, I'm going to tell them I'm five miles. And three miles, I'm going to call another, make another radio call, and then short final, I'm going to make another radio call. I'm briefing how I'm going to make my radio calls. And then I'm breathing my speed. So jumped out all the way down to about three miles, two miles from the runway, 90 knot ground speed. About two miles from the runway, slow down to 80 knots. When I see the runway, deploy the flap, final approach speed, 172 is 65, 70, we got ready to land. And then I breathe, if I have to go around, go around, climb to an altitude, direct to Lycky, and then I'm going to tell approach, NorCal, I want to be vector away. I am not doing this hold. <laughs> Could you just give me an alternate miss? This is how I breathe in the air. I do it, takes maybe a minute, but I am planning exactly what I'm going to do. So there's no surprise. <clears throat> so here's how, what happens when we transition from VMC to IMC. Uh, question is 5,000 the wrong altitude for a direct a flight. Okay. So I was just about to answer that, that we filed for six, but we're amended based on our clearance for that day. Yes. 5, uh, because you have San Francisco traffic, that's where air traffic control comes in and plays the part of figuring out, you know, how's this all going to work out. Uh, so it was amended. I was going to ask a question on that. So you had mentioned 6,000. Yeah. I think that 6,000 is the bottom of the bottom shelf of that. Right. Area. And so, to your point about class Bravo, like if they had cleared you through that at 6,000, even though you're kind of making the bottom of the Bravo shelf, you're fine. You don't care. So, yeah, so multiple answers. Bravo airspace is not really a factor when you're IFR. You're not getting that, you're cleared into the Bravo airspace. So, remain outside of Bravo. That does not factor at all in flying IFR. Okay. The other part is we have pretty good radar coverage. Uh, so, that, that plays a part in their ability to issue. Five thousand, but yeah. and keep it clear of terrain. Yeah, no, I was just intrigued because it's a VFR pilot. You know, I was kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. don't mess with that. But here, it's kind of like if you if you're clear, then you don't have to worry about it. It's kind of nice thing. Yeah. So for people online, I don't know if you can hear the conversation, but the question in the chat is: Is five thousand the wrong altitude for direct flight? We filed 6,000 feet, but ATC amended the altitude to 5,000 feet. So we fly whatever ATC tells us. The route of flight and the altitude dependent 
gets overwritten by ATC when a day tells you what altitude, you fly that altitude, unless you want to negotiate for a different altitude. And the other thing is we're not worried about airspace at all in IFR flight plan. So we don't care about what where Bravo begins, where it ends. You will never hear clear into class Bravo on an IFR flight plan. That's just not a thing. That's the fabulous thing about flying IFR is even if it's a perfectly clear VFR day and you're going to a complex airspace, bio IFR, that's the simplest way to get from A to B. <laughs> and then you don't have to worry about airspaces at all. <laughs> you don't have to worry about being clear into Bravo. That's already a given. But you can file one altitude, but you might be amended at different altitude. Don't worry about it. Fly it at other altitude. As long as you know that you can clear terrain, then you're comfortable with that altitude and that works for you. Uh, sometimes I ask for altitude amendment for tailwinds as well. So when we flew in a jet, we would look for where's the tailwind and we'll ask for an altitude because there's better tailwind there. We'll get there faster or more fuel economy. You, know, you can always negotiate altitude. A lot of students are like, oh, we're going west and we're in an odd number altitude. Oh my goodness. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. You're talking ADC. Ask, ask them. Um, I've noticed something similar with the airport flight problem. When you get that, oftentimes they'll put it into controlled airspaces and global copy, you know, they may hand you to a tower to send you through, but you are getting a little bit of that taste that we talked about between the um, social market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the question online, is it bad practice to accept 5,000 regardless of what ATC has in mind? Um, okay, because of the altitude regulations. So the way that NorCal works <clears throat> is there are certain requirements. And we, when we met them at Sacramento, they told us that we have to keep distance between different aircraft, a certain altitude gap distance and certain horizontal distance. And as long as we keep them clear, we're fine. So the odds and east, odds and even, east and west kind of regulation is sort of used to help ATC out. We're not even talking to ATC at all, then that keeps everyone, you know, if you're going east, flying at a general altitude, and west, flying at a general altitude. But if you're talking to ATC, that responsibility is now on them and they're monitoring traffic for you. So you can just fly whatever ATC tells you. The only thing you care about is, can I avoid all my obstacle? And does that clear me for terrain? And typically it should be, right? That's why ATC would clear you for that. Um, other things that we as IFR pilots don't see is what's called minimum vectoring altitude, which is another map that air traffic controller have that you don't have. And it's lower than the altitude that we see on our charts. And that's where like ATC can have a little play. They can put you a little bit lower than what your charts might say because it's still within their minimum vectoring altitude. Um, but usually what ATC tells you, you can follow that unless you want to negotiate for other reason like fuel or tailwinds or terrain or more direct route. So you're if you, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, sorry, if you if you're gonna negotiate with the ATC, do you do it when they give you the amended clearance right away, or do you take off on as cleared and then negotiate in the air in uh, as you're actually trying to get the, the, the two different altitudes? You can do both. We usually do both. So let's say they clear us on the ground and it looks like it's an out, a route that's really long and crazy. We might ask, uh, could we go direct here? Would that be okay? So we'll negotiate with clearance delivery on the ground. And then during the flight, as things are happening, we might negotiate in the air. For example, we're constantly being flying around thunderstorm. Uh, so we're negotiating different routes based on what our weather radar might show and we might fly a different route because of the weather. And so you can negotiate in the ground and on the air. Mm -hmm. And in, in, 
in the case of altitude like if you know you prefer this altitude because of fuel burn and tailwind mm -hmm. does it make sense to to do it right on the ground or is it just something that that you can you, you might as well skip it and ask for for higher altitudes while you're there so this is like the question of if you're a kid and you want candy you go to mom and you ask mom can i have a candy she says <laughs> no you go to dad <laughs> and you ask, can i have the candy and dad says yes um this is the kind of game that i play i see so i i just work with a controller you know i would negotiate in the ground if they say no i go okay what fly would you tell me i talk to another controller i guess my request again sometimes that controller say yes Makes uh, sense. controllers have ability to say yes differently as well so that's the other nuance is if you're within this sector this person can say yes but if you're outside of this sector he cannot say yes to you just yet the next person is the person who can grant you that permission so I keep asking for what I want without being too much of a nuisance, and usually they say yes. <laughs> uh, but that sort of thinking did not work out in Brazil when, because one crew came into ATC idea was best. So I'll have to look at um, <clears throat> the communications and what happened in the scenario, but what ACC, me, job is to separate the different aircraft, right? And then there are different equipment in the aircraft that could help keep traffic separation as well. Oh, what was the question about? So he said that sort of thinking did not work out in Brazil when two planes came together because one crew caved into ATC idea of what's best. And then he sent a Wikipedia um, article. I have to read that. But there's what AT tells you, and that's back to the beginning of the conversation. It's not a parent-child relationship where they tell you what to do and you comply. It's an adult-to-adult -adult relationship where you have to know what you're doing, <laughs> negotiate, figure out what's happening around the area, have that situational awareness, and talk to each other. Because remember, air traffic controllers, a lot of the time, are not pilots. You got to tell them what's happening and what you want. So here's our transition from VMC into IMC. Um, I make sure that as we go from clear sky to the clouds, left or right, high or low, fast or slow, maintain those three fundamental things. A lot of time, new pilots or maybe not very proficient pilots get stuck on a checklist. And they're sitting there trying to figure out, should I turn on my landing lights or not? Should I pull out carb heat now or not? And all the while, they've lost sight of the track. They lose altitude. They're too low or too high. And I go, what is your primary goal? Lever right, higher low, faster slow. You get that stable, then the light switches and the carb heat and all those little things that are, yes, important. Um, that you want to do when everything is stable, right? But don't fixate on everything as if they're equal priority, because your priority, number one, is not to fly into mountains, right? Maintain your course, your altitude, and maintain your speed in a way that you can control the aircraft. I like to say the critical numbers out loud. What that might sound like is I'm, I'm tracking a desired track. I would say, I'm flying desire track 310, maintain above 3,000 feet, 90 knot ground speed. 310, 3,000 feet, 90 knot ground speed. I repeat that loop because in my hearing that sound, it's a prompt for me to scan my instrument. When I stop saying things out loud, I forget about it. I don't think about it. And then I lose heading altitude and speed real quick. So I like to say things out loud. I also try to avoid head movements. Um, and I'll show you in the next slide how I set up my system so that I don't have to move my head. I'm just moving my eyeballs because the more head movements you have, especially if you're in the clouds, if it's turbulence, 
it can cause distraction and it can cause spatial disorientation. And then if I am about to go into the clouds, carp heat on in a training aircraft, pedo heat on, and then keep straight and level attitude for the plane. And then for me, <laughs> I keep straight and level. Um, here's how I scan my instruments. And here's how I think about it. So I set my iPad on the side window. I remove it before I land. But I set it on the side window at the same sight line. That's all my instruments. That way I'm just scanning back and forth with my eyeballs. A lot of people mount the iPad on a yoke or on the kneeboard. I've tried both of them. It didn't work for me. One, because when I'm turning, my iPad is now crooked. <laughs> I can't read it, especially if I'm flying a DME arc. Uh, two, if I'm putting it on a yoke or on, an, on my knee, I'm now looking up and down, up and down, and I skip over the instruments. So I put it on the same sight line. That's what I do. Then I think of the way I scan my instruments using a musical instrument, an eight count note. One and two and three and four. So I'm looking at a indicator, heading indicator, speed, right? I'm going through each of my instrument, GPS, four flight. I'm going through eight note count. I'm scanning everyone, including never fixating or emitting anyone. Right, and including the compass GPS. So for flight, my six pack compass GPS, I'm putting them on. And then I fly. I just focus left or right, high or low, fast or slow. Once I have everything stable, make sure I do the checklist, the C in the checklist. Once I land at the aircraft, once I land the aircraft at the airport, if you're at a non-towered airport, you have to close your IFR flight plan. If you're at a towered airport, tower does it for you. But if you are at a non-towered airport, you have to do it yourself because the way that IFR system works is one in, one out. If you're still on the IFR and the ATC thinks you're still actively flying, they have to keep everyone out of the way because they don't know what you're about to do. Um, so you want to close your flight plan so other people can come in and flight that approach as well. There are several ways to close it. Uh, when you're flying the flight, NorCal will usually tell you, do you want a phone number to close it? Um, you can also get the phone number from the AFD to chart supplement as well. And you can cancel your IFR flight plan either during the flight, as soon as you see the runway, or on the ground. You can call using your Bluetooth people headset if you have one, or after you land, pick up your phone and call. Or try your radio if you can reach NorCal on the ground. So do it in the air on the ground. Any questions on the approach? Good question. Um, when you pick up the ATIS, mm -hmm. do you personally dial that in as soon as you pick it up, or, or, correction, ah. when you get the altimeter mm -hmm. of the ATIS, do you dial that in as soon as you pick it up, or do you wait till you're closer to the terminal environment? Yes, absolutely. Your... So the question is, when you listen to altimeter, when do you program in the altimeter setting if you get altimeter at the airport, like altimeter 29087? For me, my general rule is when I'm about five to 10 miles, from my initial approach fix. That's when I start slowing my aircraft down to 90 knot ground speed and start putting in the altimeter. Before that, I keep whatever ATC tells me is the altimeter setting. But as I'm approaching about five to 10 miles from the initial approach fix or whatever my approach fix is, I start putting in altimeter. Any other questions on the approach? Online, in person. Uh, you mentioned that you removed the iPad part of that. Yeah, because I want to see VFR traffic. So the question is, why do I remove the iPad before landing? Um, you have it on your left window, is that right? I have it on my left window. So it depends. If I'm flying an IFR approach and it's actual IMC and I'm coming in, there's not a lot of people and it's just straight in landing, then I keep everything stable and fly a beautiful approach coming into land. 
But if I'm coming in the airport and it's kind of VFR, I pop out of clouds, there's a lot of people in a traffic pattern and I'm transitioning from an IFR pilot into the VFR traffic pattern, I'll just get rid of the, just move the iPad so I can see all my window shield, all size of the window. So it depends on what my workload is and what I'm doing at that moment. Other questions online, in person? Thumbs up if you're still with me. All right, thank you. There you go. It's so quiet when I can see all your beautiful faces online. Okay, so let's plan the departure. This is a, something we don't think about a lot as IFR pilots. I think we talk a lot about instrument approaches, but not so much on departure. And sometimes departure is really critical in whether we should even land there at all. For example, if you're flying an Aspen approach into Colorado, you better make sure your airplane can take off and depart from the runway. You might be able to land there, but could it, does it have the capability and the performance to be able to take off, clear those mountains when you depart? So that's a very important criteria thinking not just can I approach and land, but what about leaving? Can I depart from the runway? So let's talk about the departure procedures <clears throat> at Half Moon Bay. In the Half Moon Bay, there's a, a what's called obstacle departure procedure, ODP. And if you look at the takeoff minimums, you see that runway one, two, it requires the CLA 2600 to touch a mile visibility or standard with a minimum climb of 306 feet per nautical mile to 3,400 feet. So you gotta calculate and see if your aircraft can meet that performance. For example, our aircraft, I might calculate that when I take off, I climb 500 feet per minute and my cruise climb 90 knots. Um, so I'm able to climb 333 feet per nautical miles. If I climb a VY 76, 76 knots in a 172, maybe I get a bit more climb performance. It's usually 390 feet per nautical miles. So the first thing I wanna make sure is, could I meet the climb gradient that's required? And I noticed runway 30 takeoff is not available. So I would come in and land at Hat Moon Bay on the RNAP 30, stay in inland, but I would take off on runway 12. That means I gotta make sure the weather that day, when it's relatively calm, so I could land on 30, take off 12, and still be fine. I don't want any strong gusty wind that would make either the approach or the takeoff really difficult, or maybe impossible. And then we look at the departure procedure. So climb runway heading 3000, direct to Woodside, VOR, and then cross the Woodside at above 3,500 feet before proceeding on course. So that's what we know. How do you get an IFR clearance at a non-towered airport? Same way when you close the IFR clearance is you can get the frequency of NorCal or you can get clearance over delivery phone number, and you can call them. You can use your Bluetooth headset to call NorCal using the phone number, or you can try the frequency, or you can use your phone and call them. Um, if you do use your phone to call NorCal because you don't have a Bluetooth headset, <clears throat> one thing you might want to make sure you know is how long it takes for you to run up because you're going to want to tell NorCal how long it's going to take you before you're ready to fly, and they're going to give you a clearance void time. So they'll give you a clearance, and it might sound something like this. So I might call NorCal on this phone number using my Bluetooth radio headset, and I say, NorCal departure, Skyhawk 54102, morning short, runway 12 at Half Moon Bay, and picking up IFR clearance into Reed Hobie. And the air traffic controller might say 54102, clear Woodside, clear to Reed Hillview, direct to Woodside, climb maintain 3000, expect 
5,005 minutes departure frequency, 13575 SWAC 4631. Then I write in my shortcut way that I do, KRHV, Woodside, OSI, 3, space, 5, subscript, 5 for the time, frequency 135.75, and my SWAC code. So here's what happened when we flew the departure. <clears throat> we departed runway 12, and we entered the clouds at 500 AGO. So pretty quickly after we flew, we take off. Taylor's my pilot monitoring, I'm flying the aircraft, I'm maintaining runway heading, making sure I'm holding that at least VY speed or a little bit higher because I don't want to stall the aircraft. And Taylor's making sure I'm holding that heading because we know that when we're taking off runway one, two, mountains is now on my left side, oceans on my right side. We don't want to veer off course. What happened was when we try to contact NorCal, no one talked to us because they gave us the wrong frequency during clearance. So there was a moment of like distraction, confusion. We're like, why is no one talking to us? What do we do now? And Taylor said, you fly the airplane. I'm going to figure this out. That's the pilot monitoring job. He looked up the chart supplement. He looked at the plate. And he found the frequency 135.1. He put it in. I fly the airplane. He tried to figure out the radio. He finally talked to NorCal. And then at that point, NorCal gave us vector. At 1,800 feet MSL, so that's about a thousand layer, like we expected from the Pyra. We climb out of clouds and now we're in VFR. And we kept flying back. Now we have two choices. We can keep staying on the IFR flight plan. But the caveat to that is sometimes in the Bay Area, if you're on an IFR flight plan, they can vector you in a giant circle because of all the jet traffic. So once we are VFR and we're clear of Class Bravo, around this corner here, we cancel IFR because we no longer need to be worried about Bravo, but we stay with flight following. That way we can cross over San Jose International and it's a straight shot to Reed Hillview. If you are still in the clouds or if it's hazy, if you're not sure, you might stay in IFR, be ready to be vector around for an approach into a read hillview. But know that you can pick up IFR, you can cancel IFR, go back and forth between VFR and IFR, just like you're negotiating for your route, your altitude. This is a conversation, adult-to-adult -adult relationship you have with ATC not a parent child, um, to communicate what you want. So now we're going to finish up with risk management. Any uh, questions so far? Uh, if, you, if you cancel your IFR, but then you decide, oh, that was a bad idea, can you pick up the same plan back again? Um, in general, you could say, so we do this sometimes at Reed Hillview. You could take off VFR at Reed Hillview, and let's say you're going southbound. If you fly to a certain altitude, usually the minimum vectoring altitude, 4,000, 5,000 feet, depending on where you are, you can pick up IFR in the air. And then ATC, as long as you're above their minimum vectoring altitude, they might give you a clearance. Usually the clearance might be similar to what you got before. Mm -hmm. So they might say, okay, um, I'll put you back on IFR flight plan, fly direct to this fix or fly this heading. Right, but it will in general be a different plan. You cannot just go like, oh, I just had a plan, I cancel it at this point, it kind of disappears and you have to think from scratch in more or less. In general, it's the same, similar. Like it mm -hmm. wouldn't be something weird. Right. Big giant circle. They'll probably... ATC's goal is to be efficient as possible. So mm -hmm. they're going to get you from A to B as fast as possible. That's their job, right? Um, keeping in mind other traffic and making sure everyone is safe. So they're working with some of the constraints that they have. But if you're continuing on your route, and that is the most efficient route toward your 
airport and there's no other aircraft that you might interfere with, they'll probably let you continue that route. Mm -hmm. But if there's other traffic that are coming in, like a jet is coming in and you're a little bit too slow and you're Cessna 172 or you know, Piper planes, they might vector you around the other faster traffic. A great question. Uh, the uh, the one thing you want to note is ATC cannot clear you for IFR unless you're above a certain minimum vectoring altitude. So you don't want to be too low and then you see the clouds and you try to pick up IFR because a lot of time they'll say, nothing I can do until you are able to stay in VFR and climb to this altitude and then I can help you out with IFR. Mm -hmm. Can you ask in that situation for a permission to cloud to climb into the clouds above the MVA? Or is that another thing? That would not be legal because unless you're an IFR flight plan, you cannot go into the clouds. Right. Yeah. So you would have to go away, find a VFR airport divert. Mm -hmm. And that's where if you're not familiar, it can get really tricky if you're mm -hmm. what we call scut running. Because right. you're flying really low, but low to clouds, and then you try to pick up IFR and you can't, and mm -hmm. you don't know how you're going to be able to get back to your airport. Right. So in, in in this case, like you might end up just needing to declare an emergency if if you're yeah. not really in VFR position. Yeah, and if you can't find a divert diversion um, location, so I'm just reading what Bob is saying. Uh, you're wrong. Departure frequency is precisely why right. I would never accept direct to which side a VOR sits on top of a rock. You're zooming toward it. You can easily forget to climb while trying to work out. Yeah. Yeah. So you could, wow, absolutely right. So if you are not comfortable with that, you could ask for a different clearance. Uh, sometimes with local knowledge, you know that ATC will clear you for a certain location. But as soon as you get radar vector, you know they'll vector you away from it and you never really actually have to go to Woodside unless you have a lost comp scenario, then you have to go there. But if there's a certain direction fix route that you're not comfortable with, you can ask clearance delivery and see if they can give you a different route. Yeah. So if you, if you happen to be in Bravo and you cancel your IFR clearance, are you still here then to Bravo or you need to, yeah. what do you do? Mm -hmm. You probably wouldn't want to cancel IFR while you're in Bravo um, <laughs> because that's your get out of jail free card, right? <laughs> so that you don't have to worry about anything. Um, but I don't know why you would cancel IFR in Bravo. But you might communicate with approach at that time and say, hey, if I cancel VFR here, um, am I still clear into Bravo? Can I continue flying or do I have to immediately get out? I like to over communicate. If there is a question I'm not sure about, I ask them first um, and then I'm double sure. Yeah. But it could be that if you happen to be in Bravo and you cancel, they would expect you to immediately exit Bravo. And then you might be flying this long route that you weren't planning on. Now you're burning into your fuel reserve. So it might be wise to just stay in Bravo because that's usually the shortest way through air spaces if you're an IFR flight plan. Any other questions? I love your comments, Bob. You're thinking and you're engaging, participating. It's fantastic. All right. The last thing I want to mention is this idea of risk management. So I think of flying like a bank account. You're either depositing into the account or withdrawing from the account. And you're constantly weighing your decision. Am I depositing or am I withdrawing right now? For example, if you're flying and you have low experience, you're not very proficient and you're not very current, that's a withdrawal. But if you put in a CFII who is highly experienced, very pro proficient and current, you have deposited into your bank account. If you're flying with a VFR pilot versus an IFR pilot, 
VFR pilot is a deposit into your account compared to a non-pilot at all, but an IFR pilot will be a higher deposit. You're flying with an instructor who is very proficient current, that's an even higher deposit. You're thinking about your human factors, your I'm safe. If you are at the tail end of COVID and you're a little sniffly, well, that's a withdrawal. <laughs> but if you're really healthy, and just sleeping a lot, and eating really well, that's a deposit. So you're constant weighing what is your bank account? How big of a bank account do I have? I want to stack the deck as much money in my bank account as I can. If you're flying from VMC to IMC, you know, coach yourself on that visual illusion. That transition from no cloud to clouds can disorient pilots like crazy. So if you have trained IFR and gotten your instrument rating with very low actual IMC experience, and you do want to fly into actual IMC, do it with a well-trained proficient pilot first. Don't do it by yourself because that moment going in cloud, out of clouds, very scary. And a lot of people do the craziest things <laughs> when that happens. And I've seen that and I'm always ready to take over because I know that um, this can be a disorienting. But let's say you do become disoriented to the cloud. There are two things you could do. One, look at the attitude indicator and just for that moment, focus on that. That usually helps with any vertigo, spatial disorientation that you might have. Um, the other thing that can be helpful is if you put on your foggles. <laughs> if you fly an actual MC and you're starting to get disorienting because it's so white outside, don't know what you're doing, put on your foggles, you're back to that instrument student training mode and for that moment that can help reset your orientation having another pilot monitoring extraordinarily helpful as well so adding the deposits so that's the p right we are looking at a paved checklist the other checklist in aeronautical decision making is the 5p so i just talk about the p and people or within the 5p you have the pilot and the passengers let's talk about the airplane What's the plane capable of? Stronger, bigger plane, more deposit into your system, except that if the plane is too strong and you're not able to control the plane, well, that's a withdrawal. I mean, we have many pilot error reports where the pilot is flying a plane that's too fast um, and they're behind the aircraft. Well, even if the plane is really highly capable because the pilot can't catch up, that's actually a withdrawal. That's a negative in your bank account. So you want to fly the plane that you're capable of handling. What's the plane IFR capability? Does it have loss? Does it have ability to pick up iOS? Um, can it tune an ID, the VOR localizer on its own, or do you have to do it by yourself? The programming, what's your GPS capable of? Well, your GPS can be highly capable, but if you're not familiar with it, that's a withdrawal, right? But if you're familiar with your GPS, the more advanced your avionics, that's a deposit. So you want to think, am I withdrawing here or depositing money? And you also want to think about fuel reserve. The more fuel, that's a deposit into the account. Unless you're flying airline there, and sometimes too much fuel, that's a withdrawal. <laughs> and sometimes you can't land if you have too much fuel. So you want to think, am I adding or subtracting? Think about a runway environment. If you have a long runway, that's a deposit, gives you more option. If you have short runway, very narrow, that's a withdrawal. What's the surface conditions? One time we're coming into an airport, Boise, Idaho, and it was snowing and icy. So the surface condition was level three. Five is good, three is bad, zero is no go. After we landed, and I'm flying in the jets. So we landed and the plane starts skidding. And the captain, he's a retired American airline pilot. He's controlling the airplane. I'm just monitoring at this moment. We're skidding down the runway. He's having trouble controlling aircraft because the surface condition was icy and snowing. So what's the surface condition? That's a withdrawal. But a dry, long, wide runway, that's the deposit. What's the traffic pattern? Are everyone really busy? What's the noise abatement procedures? 
Also thinking about your visibility and ceiling. How high do you have after you pop off the clouds before you can land? I mean, what's the win? What's your minimums? You always want to have your minimums. And then the external pressure, the E and the paved checklist, or the last P and the plan, the five Ps, pilot passenger plane program plan. What's your mission? A lot of accidents can happen for a very virtuous mission, like a rescue mission. People are flying um, to transport medical patients, right? some you know, transport animals, very virtuous mission, but because the mission is heartfelt and deep and good, that it makes people want to achieve the mission, and that could be an external pressure for you. Usually a deadline, I gotta be here at a certain time is a pressure that could pull into your withdrawal bank account. Uh, thinking about your diversions and your alternate airport, is the alternate airport somewhere where you wanna go to? Like if I had to divert from Half Moon Bay to San Jose, that's a deposit. I like San Jose, just great restaurants there. This hotel, I can stay there. But maybe I wouldn't want to divert to a quiet, private airport that there's nothing there. What if I have maintenance issues? It's not much option. What if I want a restaurant, hotel? So you want to choose an alternate that you would like to go there. That way, you're depositing into your bank account. Uh, make alternate travel plans if you have to and bring your personal equipment. So here's how I think of risk management. Am I adding or am I subtracting? Am I depositing or withdrawal? What are my decisions when it comes to pilot? What am I capable of? What are my passengers capable of? What's the plane? What about my GPS? What's my plan? What's the goal here? What's about the weather, the airport, the alternate? Always Think about making decisions where you're adding into the system instead of taking it away. If you take away so much that your bank account is low, you're in dire situation. That's a no-go. Add as much bank account, stack your deck. So that's your final word for today is maximize your safety deposit. First code word is Tiles three keys. Second code word, maximize your safety deposit. If there's only two things you get away from today's webinar or seminar, if you're here, is three keys, left or right, high or low, fast or slow, and maximize your safety deposit. Always make decisions where you're adding into it. All right, so that concludes my um, presentations. Um, yes, any questions? Uh, the uh, yeah. the clouds, and what is the minimum for us to, to file the the uh, approach? Ah, okay, so the question is, what's the requirement for logging in an IFR approach? Uh, the answer to that, oh, will. Um, Send you a document that describe it because it has some details of it. It's a commonly asked questions, and I want to point you to the correct regulations. Um, okay, so today is the first portion of our IFR wings. Um, next Saturday, we're going to talk about IFR flying into Monterey. So we're going to build up upon what we talk about and see how the Monterey approaches are different or similar. Then we'll talk about Watsonville. And then if you, the first, okay, the first code word is the three keys. How's three keys? Uh, Left or right, higher, low, faster, slow. Done, uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, whatever captured that spirit of the idea. Um, it just lets me know that you've attended the class. And then if you want to attend the ground school, it starts in January of next year. To get your FA Wings credit, please complete the Google form bit.ly slash Ivar Half Moon. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. But I'm open to questions now if you have it online or in person about today's topic or IFR flying in general. Yes. Yeah. Do you personally prefer 
government plates or Jepson in water? Ah, okay. So the question is, do you prefer a government plate or Jefferson plate and why? There are different nuances between them, and Taylor and I talk about this a lot. I use a train, a Jefferson's plate. Jefferson's plate is great when showing the approach path. Um, it's really nice, but what is missing is the airport diagram, which I think the government plate has really well. Jefferson plate, the way it display can be more clear on your descent and the approach path in. Jefferson plate is also used if you're going to fly international. So if you plan to be commercial pilot, an airline pilot, you might want to get comfortable with Jefferson, Jefferson plate uh, during your training. That way, when you're in the commercial world, it's easy. You're already there, and you have had the experience of a CFWI teaching you how to read the plate. Uh, FAA plates is available just for US and it's free. So anyone can have access to that. And they have different features. So I think Jepson's plate is great for uh, final approach fix if there's a timer, the drawing of the line of the descent profile is really good and super clear on Jepson's plate. Uh, the um, FAA plates it has the drawing of the airport diagram. Super helpful if you're doing a circling approach and you're trying to figure out how do I circle north or south. You can draw on the plate and it's really obvious. Jepson's plate doesn't have that. I, I believe Jepson plates also are geotagged because they're to scale and the FAA plates are not. So they cannot be they cannot be used for navigation. You have to do it on the on the actual charts. Say it one more time. Oh, uh, the Jepson plates are drawn to scale, so they can be they can be geotagged. The FAA are not, so they are not useful for actual navigation. Um, I don't think that's true in my experience. So what I like to do, and a lot of people ask me what for flight. If you have a subscription, there's three tier. Which tier do you use? I use the second tier or the third tier, because it allowed geo-referencing plates, which mean that I can look at my sectional and it will display the approach plate. And then as I'm flying, it will geo-reference it. And then I can see my little airplane icon over the plate and it's pretty accurate for me. I mean, you can use your iPad yeah. for the references, not for the actual. Uh, right. Documentary. Yes. So Dimitri brought up a really great point, which is you can use your four flight for monitoring, for figuring out what you're doing, but don't use it to fly right. the approach right. <laughs> because it's not designed for that. One of the questions the examiner would have for you is uh, if you have a watch, does that count as a clock in the airplane for all your timing purposes? And the regulation is it has to be built in the aircraft. It's a similar thing, your GPS has to be built in. You can't just have your watch and call us the required clock. And you can't just have your four flight and use that to fly the entire approach. And your georeferencing on, on four flight works with the FAA plates as well? Oh, yeah, fantastic. Oh. But you need to have the second tier right. of four flight subscription. The second tier is also great because it shows height AGL. So that's a feature I really like. I want to know how high above the ground I am. <laughs> and that's important to me. Any other questions? Thank you, Mackie, for typing in. Yeah, three keys, as in uh, your keychain, is the first code word. And then the second is maximize your deposit, your safety deposits. Any other questions? Awesome, thank you for joining. I appreciate all your time. I have the recording, thanks. Pretty emojis, I love emojis. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then on your Google form, you can put in whether you want a recording of this or you know, if you there's a place to add comments, love it, hate it, you could have done this better. I didn't understand what you're talking about here. Feel free to put in a comment. Please email me, contact me, put your email address. Um, 
that you prefer in there that's helpful as well. I love to have conversations with each of you guys, so please stay connected. And thank you, everyone. I'm going to sign off and have a good weekend. See you next Saturday. Thanks, Al. Thank you, Al.